I just want to touch a few things that, that took place in Jesus' life at, uh, at the end and, and also in the church. And um, the, the path that we're going to take today will lead us to the actual power and the purpose of the church. And the first thing is I want us to remember that Jesus was the exact representation of God. Nothing was left out. Sometimes we don't get that. Uh, th that. This is a covenant statement again. You know, as, and as we're going through this, uh, my, my eyes have been opened again as I'm reading the Bible every day and I'm going, oh, that, that's a covenant piece. That's a kingdom piece. That's a covenant piece. There's covenant language. There's kingdom language. And I hope that some of you are getting some of that. I mean, it, it's really good stuff. But, but we remember that when Jesus was baptized, that the relationship of who he had with the Father was clearly stated and so this is in Luke 3 one of the places Luke 3 21 to 23 it says now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came from heaven you are my beloved son with you I'm well pleased we used that earlier um, in this series and when Jesus begins his ministry, it begins with a clear expression of the covenant, okay, um, and the kingdom. Uh, his father says, this is my son, there's covenant. And then it says, the sky is open, this barrier between heaven and earth is how they thought of this. The sky is opened and a dove comes down and descends upon Jesus and the Holy Spirit descends from heaven and remains on him, doesn't leave. And so there's this permanent link between heaven and earth. And that's the beginning of the kingdom of God. Where, and just again, kingdom means that what happens in heaven is happens here on earth. And so that's, that's the beginning. And um, so all is experienced in heaven is now beginning to be experienced here on earth through Jesus. And Jesus is declared to be pleasing to God before he does anything. He's not, he's not done any miracles. He's not done any great acts. And the Father says, this is my son, and I'm pleased in him. So he's vested with the blessing in the same way that we are vested with the blessing. And, you know, God says that he perfectly represents who he is. And Jesus says the same thing, too. He says, you know, when you see me, you see the Father. And if you had known the Father, you'd know me. There's, there's no difference here. So I perfectly represent who God is. And so John tells us in his gospel, um, and we find ourselves understanding for the first time who God the Father really is. I mean, what the heart of the Father is towards us. Because if we know Jesus, okay, and if we know who he is, then we know the Father. The Father longs for us to be restored. The Father longs for us to have joy. The Father longs for us to experience forgiveness and deliverance. And how do we know that? Because Jesus, because Jesus shows us who the Father is. In John 1.18, uh, John begins his gospel by saying, No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Other translations will say he's revealed him. To us so there's nothing about God that we don't know if we know Jesus he's the perfect he's the complete revelation of who God is and today there's all this you know and there always has been in the church there's all this mystical stuff is it oh you can't know God he's too big and he's too mysterious and nobody can really know who he is and Jesus says that's not so if you known me you know the Father John the Apostle says he's, he explains who God is to us. He reveals who God is to us. There's nothing yet that's hidden, you know. And in the same vein, Jesus told his disciples that he said, you know, he says it's really good on the last day that he was with them. He said it's really good. This is in John 14. It's really good that I'm going away because since I'm going away, the Holy Spirit can come. And since the Holy Spirit can come, he says, 
you're much better off. He says, I'm not leaving you like orphans. This is John 14, 16. He says, because when I leave, the Holy Spirit will be sent to you and you won't just see the power of the Spirit, but you'll know the Holy Spirit. You'll know what the presence of God is because I'm going away. And then he gives them and us a really great promise that you know, we still might be trying to uh, accept. It's in John 14, 20. He says, in that day, you will know that I'm in my Father and you in me and I in you. You go, hmm. Now, if we've been paying attention here, some bells might go off because we hear him saying that everything has changed for those who are in covenant with him, is what he's saying. He said, we will be one. I mean, that's the covenant reality. When we are in covenant with someone, we die to our old selves, they die to their old self, and that we become one person. That's what covenant means. We will live in Christ if we have died with him. Uh, Romans 6, 8. So that's how Paul says it. And that's what Jesus says. He says, I'm in the Father, you're in me, and I'm in you, we're one. He says, in fact, we are so one that by, by means of the Holy Spirit, you can ask anything of the Father, he said, and it will be done. It's John 14, 14. If you ask anything, he says, in my name, it will be done. Anything. Like, oh man, all right, finally, we get to the good stuff. I knew this being a Christian thing is going to pay off, you know. Uh, this is better than Aladdin's lamp. You just get three rubs on Aladdin's lamp, but he gives his secret stuff and secret code, you know, and we're going to get anything that we want, he said. I remember being a, a brand new Christian, and, and uh, gladly God did not give me everything that I asked for, you know, but uh, usually we kind of, you know, we're going to get some stuff, so I don't want to get too greedy, so first we ask for other people, right? But God, if you could, in Jesus' name, you've got to put the magical formula in there. In Jesus' name, Lord, if you could just change my husband. Lord, if you could just change him. He's so unhappy, you know. And Lord, if you could make him loving and kind and willing to do the dishes and, you know, make the beds. Lord, if you could just change my husband. Or, you know, Lord... Um, you know, my, my son, he's really struggling with math, and boy, he's, he's got no confidence in this, and he's been studying, I know he says he has, but he's got a math test this week, and Lord, if he could get an A, it would give him so much confidence in Jesus' name. You know, we want to put that in there. He brings home a D. You go, wow, what's happening? You know, maybe, maybe I should, maybe you got to get down on your knees to make this stuff work. Or, or maybe it's like if I would post this on Facebook, you know, get like 100 shares, maybe that would convince God that I'm really serious about this. Or maybe it's, it's the language that I'm using. Oh, Lord, thouest if thou wast, would givest my sonest an A instead of a Dist, you know, whatever. Uh, most of the time when this happens, you know, and we ask for anything and then God gives nothing in that. Uh, one of two things start happening, well, or maybe both at the same time. We start disbelieving that the Bible is really true. The second thing is, is we start wondering if there's something wrong with me, you know, that I'm not able to avail myself. Maybe it's some hidden thing that I haven't done and I'm blocking all this magic that's supposed to take place. And I want us to get this before we go on because if we don't get this, we're never going to get the second part of what God has for the church. When Jesus gives his followers his name, listen to me, when Jesus gives his followers his name, what that means is that we are now one. Remember in our covenant stuff when we were going through the Old Testament, he changes Abraham's name. Okay? He changes Jacob's name. The, the renaming is part of the covenant, and he gives us his name, Jesus. And so when we are asking in his name, and we are in covenant with him, what that means is that we are one with him. And, you know, this means it's like he said in the same way that he said, I do nothing except what the Father tells me, 
you know, Jesus said, I'm listening to the Father and what he tells me to do, I do. When you're living in covenant with me, when you're living in my name, you're listening to me, and you do what I ask you to do, okay? So the question remains for us, would, would Jesus ask the Father to give somebody an A instead of a D if they hadn't studied for the test? No, he wouldn't do that. See, if we're really one with him, if we're really listening to him and living in him, then we don't ask that question either because we don't want our son to get an A when he really deserves a D because we'd be teaching him not to study is what we would be teaching him. We'd be teaching him how to use magic incantations of some God that he doesn't know. Because if we really know this God, if we're really one with this God, we're going to ask in the same way that Jesus would ask. That's what it means to be in his name. And I know this really restricts a lot of our prayers, so it seems. But, but think, think on the positive side of this. Think what this opens up. If we're listening to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, where we're seeking to walk like Jesus, live like Jesus, think like Jesus, if we're really one with him, then our prayers in him, our prayers in his name, in his person, in his authority, will bring healing, they'll bring restoration, they'll bring power over evil, protection of the weak, they're going to set captives free, bondages, they're going to move literal mountains. Because if we're listening to him, we're going to pray the way that he would pray. See, And that is what it means to ask anything in my name. Jesus also in this same section, John 14, this is crucial for the church, I think. John 14 said, uh, John 14, 12 to 14 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. And he goes on to say, Whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do. He says, greater works. I mean, that's even a, a larger statement. We're going to do more signs and wonders and works like Jesus did? Ah, gee. I mean, and then he goes on to say, I'm going to the Father so the Holy Spirit can come to you. And the result of that is that you're going to do even greater things than this. And, you know, I've, I've heard um, so-called scholars talk about this. I'm not knocking scholars. I'm not knocking um, knowing things about the Bible or studying the Bible at all. But let me explain. They, they try to explain this and they say, well, what that means is that since there's millions of us, that there's going to be more of them. Okay, I can buy that. And then he says, then they say, well, right after this, it says that, um, right after this, it says that uh, we will do greater things because... Um, the commandment is, is that we would love one another. So that's what he's talking about. He's talking about love. And I, you know, it gets down to this. I feel, I feel sorry for us, uh, myself included, when I'm completely restricted only by what I can understand and explain. And there, there comes an end to my, my ability to scientifically understand things. And, you know, science is a, is a great thing, but there does come an end to that. And, and when I get to that point, you know, I, I need to trust in God. The Holy Spirit is the one who's doing the works here, uh, not me. Well, let's move on. Well, 50 days after this upper room experience where Jesus promised that, that they could do greater works, the Holy Spirit's poured out, not just on the 12, but on the 120, that's at the day of Pentecost. And they were waiting there in the upper room uh, for that to happen. And just like the Holy Spirit falling on Jesus at his baptism, the Holy Spirit descends on these 120 people. And this time, instead of a dove, it's like a flame of fire, kind of like that fire from which uh, God spoke to Moses out in the wilderness. And then it says that they were compelled, they were driven out of that house and out into the streets. And we know the story. God gave them these different languages and they, they told of the mighty works of God and all these people that were gathered in Jerusalem for that day because it was a big Thanksgiving celebration, you know, like with pilgrims and junk like that, that they 
Come on, you got to stay awake. There weren't pilgrims in Jerusalem. All right, okay. Uh, but all the people that were there for Thanksgiving, and um, they heard then these 120 speak of the mighty works of God in their own language and their own dialect that day. And uh, after that happened, 3,000 people came to faith. Now that's, Peter pre preached this sermon, you know, and 3,000 people come to faith. Remember, Peter is this guy that he was, you know, scaredy pants, Peter, they called him for a long time. That, you, that's, that's in some of the Apocrypha, some of the extra biblical stuff I know. You'll see this on the History Channel that he's called scaredy pants Peter, all right, after the crucifixion, because he's the one that denies Jesus three times and one time to a little girl. But Peter stands up and he's bold in the spirit and he preaches this great sermon and 3,000 people are saved. And the reason that he can do this is because that old scaredy pants Peter is dead. Old scaredy pants died in Jesus and he's a new man now. And Jesus is speaking through him and he's got such faith and such courage. And he stands up in front of these people that you know, he really should be hiding his faith because he might get crucified too, but he doesn't. He preaches in 3,000. It's amazing. I mean, he's not heroic. It's just Jesus. And the same way that the Father was in Jesus, then Jesus and the Father, now Jesus is in Peter and Peter is in Jesus. It's the same thing. And he does this. So the Holy Spirit becomes the power of the kingdom. The Spirit is, is the mark of the new covenant. In the same way that the, that the circumcision was the mark of the covenant in the old uh, Mosaic and, and Abraham covenant, now the Holy Spirit is the mark of the new covenant because the Spirit fell on male and female, it says, old and young, uh, slave and free. And what we see is just a radical change in the lives of these followers. And we, we see that, that they really are walking in Jesus they're really one with him and they're living in him and the Holy Spirit is the authority and the power of the new kingdom for instance sometime after Pentecost um, all the disciples they'd formed this new family this this new um, community and it says that every day that they were worshiping together they were getting teach teaching from the apostles together they were praying together and they were um, eating their meals together. And so this kind of this new household of believers form and they're doing life together and this, this new thing was emerging. This is in Acts 4. Uh, but one day, Peter and John were going to temple. They're still going to Jewish temple, right? And they're going to Jewish temple and, and on the way there, they, there's this guy that's always by in the same place. He's this beggar and he can't walk. And he's, you know, he asked them for some food or some, some money because that's what he did. That's how he got by. He'd never been able to walk in his life, but that's how he got by, was, was asking for money. And, you know, and they say, man, well, we don't have any money, but all we've got is Jesus. Now, I could just kind of hear the inner dialogue going on with Peter and John as they're walking on their way, and this happens because, you see, Peter and John had once been very lucrative businessmen. They'd once been fishermen. We'll have their story next week. They'd once been fishermen, and we think, oh, fishermen, you know, kind of a down class. No, fishermen were entrepreneurs. And they owned their own boats, and they were making good money up there in Caesarea, uh, or excuse me, up there at Capernaum. And so... But, but now they're not wealthy anymore. Now their wealth is spiritual wealth. They have this wealth of Jesus. Because everything that God has is theirs, right? And everything that they have is God's. That's part of the covenant thing. So, so I can just hear inside, you know, Peter and John going, what do you want me to do, Jesus? He's asking us for money. What, what should we give him? And, and they say, we don't have any money. Get up and walk. And he does. He just gets up and starts walking. This guy's never walked in his life. Whatever you ask in my name, remember Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, if you're doing it the way that I would do it, you can ask me anything and it's going to happen. Greater works than mine, you're going to do. And that's exactly what happens. And the man went running around the temple, just making a huge spectacle of himself. You know, just all around the temple. And 
it caused this huge commotion because everybody knew who he was and he's there in the temple grounds and I mean it sat he'd sat by that gate every day of his life and he had a little cardboard sign that said out of work can't feed kids God bless you know he had one of those little signs like that and they'd seen this guy and they'd walk by him every day and now here he is running around the temple and it's that you know it's because of Jesus and Peter and John these guys are doing the same thing that Jesus did. And in the midst of that commotion in the temple area, well, Peter pulls out his second sermon, and this sermon he preaches, and 5,000 believe. 5,000. First 3,000, now 5,000 people through Peter. Oh, you know, former scaredy pants, Peter. Now Jesus, Peter. And that's a huge problem for the Jewish leaders because they thought they'd gotten rid of Jesus and these guys, they were doing their weird thing up there together, they know, but you know, the Jewish leaders said, leave them alone, you know, they're all right. So they arrest him. The same people that crucified Jesus arrest Peter and John. And you know, I can, I can kind of hear the Romans in the background, you know, the guys that execute people and they're back there and you know, man, I haven't beat anybody for two or three days. Guys, get stretched out because I think we got a good beating coming on here. With, you know, got, they got uh, scaredy pants and got John, and we're gonna get a whip them and you know, uh, polish up the cross, get get the crosses ready, and you know they're doing their stretching exercises and maybe a little yoga and stuff. No, that probably doesn't fit, does it? But anyway, they're they're getting ready to do a good beating, a good flogging, and then Acts four thirteen to fourteen it says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Boldness, confidence, Peter. I mean, he's always the spontaneous one. He's always the one that's got the big mouth saying he, he can do something he can't really do. But here he's living in authority. He's living in confidence and power. And how is he doing this? Well, it's because the old Peter's dead. No, Peter's gone. Now he's a new man. This is Jesus living in him. And then it says that they perceived and recognized them as uneducated and common men. Now, there's a class difference here. Well, we've got the Jewish leaders that are a very high educated, wealthy class against these once former fishermen, and they go, Who are these guys? And then that phrase, they recognize them as one who had been with Jesus. I love that passage of scripture. These two guys are recognized as men who have been with Jesus. Wow. So they let them off with a warning on one condition. They say, well, you can go. You can do your little thing with your guys up there and you have your little community and stuff, but just don't talk about Jesus anymore. You're free to go, you know, start your little click, but no more Jesus stuff. And they say this, Acts 4, 19 to 20. Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. <laughs> we can't help ourselves, because you see, <laughs> this is who I am. It's, it's just, he's just in me. You decide what you want to do with what God is saying, but you see, fellas, we can't stop speaking for Jesus because he is in us. We are the same. Jesus is in me and I'm in Jesus. We, we have the mark of the new covenant, the Holy Spirit on us. And that old Peter, that old John, they're dead. They're gone. <laughs> we can't help, you see, but speak for Jesus. And they let him go. And back at the ranch, at the upper room, all the people are there praying because, you know, their two leaders have been uh, arrested. And they're back there with this prayer meeting and Peter and John come and knock on the door and they can't believe it's them. And then there's a, there's a great thing. It says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. The building shook. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God 
with boldness. Now, that doesn't mean that they were pushy. It just means that they knew who they were at that time. Now, one more point before we leave this, this series. Covenant and kingdom are lived out in the church, and the church is called the body of Christ by Paul. I, I love his metaphor there as the body of Christ, and I hope that you see how this fits. Since we are in him and he is in us, covenant, we get our identity from being in covenant with him, then understand that the, the, the metaphor of the body is very fitting. We are the representation of Jesus. In the same way that Jesus represented God the Father, so we represent Jesus. And to a world that's broken and hurting and afraid, Jesus, through us, brings hope and wellness and forgiveness. And he does that through the body, the covenant partners. They take his kingdom into every home, every workplace, every office, every prison, every palace. And if his body doesn't do it, it's not going to happen. We're it. His church is it. What a mission that is. We have a purpose together. And when we lose our lives into Christ, we live as our lives into Christ. We advance his kingdom. We help bring heaven down to earth. We open up the sky. And that prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is to he in heaven, happens. When I was a kid, um, the theaters that we went to were much different than the theaters that we go to now. Um, I guess probably the biggest theater that we have in town is the Kentucky, and the Kentucky was just a very small theater back in its day, not a, not a grand theater at all. But, but the theaters that we went to were huge. They were gigantic things. And I remember going to the Fox. I think I've got a picture. This is the Fox Theater in St. Louis. It's still there. It's on Kings Highway. And when I was in high school, a buddy of mine took me to go see the first 007 movie. I'm old, old dude. Uh, Goldfinger went to see at the Fox. That's a theater. That's what it's like to walk into one of those theaters built in 1929. Gold everywhere. Those steps led up, led up to the, the mezzanine and I think two balconies. But the inside of the thing was just amazing held 2,000 people this is where they showed movies <laughs> the Fox Theater and during the depression you know that they built a lot of movie theaters like this it cost you 25 cents to go see a movie but if you had the money in the depression you know we think things are rough now we don't have any idea <laughs> you know what it was to be in the depression but they went to movies because they could go to this other world. And just for a couple of hours, they were transported into the talkies that were coming out then and to what life could be. And the movie theaters introduced that to them. They, they gave them this different world to see. Okay? When the two hours was over, they, they went out and stood in food lines like everybody else if they had to to get by. It was very popular during the 1930s. And the body of Christ, I think, is a lot like classic theaters, you know. God's called us to give the world a preliminary picture of what things are going to be like when Jesus returns, when the kingdom is here in full. And it may just be, you know, in part, we get that. But our job is to give them pieces of the kingdom, visions of the kingdom, little bits of hope, and, and help and healing and, and deliverance in, in this world. And we, we, need, you know, we need people to get excited about God's kingdom and who they can be and, and their real identity. We're called to model a way of life that's different than the world around us. Our love, our hope, our forgiveness should offer the world the life of Christ because we are his body. Now the last thing I want us to see here, and we'll leave this into another season, is that I cannot represent the body of Christ by myself. It's not about me, it's about us. 
passage of Scripture, Matthew 18, 20, from which we get our name. Uh, Jesus says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. Two or more. Okay? It's not where you are. It's where two or more are gathered. See? It's, it's not about just my witness at the office. It's not just about my witness at school. I can't be Christ by myself. I need another person. And that's the way that God has made it. We should always be looking for someone else to join with us in the body. It has nothing to do with church membership. But when we're out as kingdom people representing him, okay, there's going to be somebody else that God puts there with us. And we join with them to represent Jesus where we are. We're never alone. God always provides someone else with us. And you stop and think about it. You know, even God is a trinity. Even God is a community. God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he's made our world, our spiritual power the same way. That we need each other to represent him. Covenant kingdom all the way through. Covenant is about relationship. Kingdom is about representing the king. It's an invitation to relationship. Disciple of oneness. It's a challenge to live and responsibility okay, of representing the king to live what we were created for. We are to be a covenant community, and it happens through the body. Now, my question I want to, to burn on us as uh, we leave this place today is, will I be recognized? Notice he recognized them, not one of them, recognized Peter and John. Will we be recognized as people who have been with Jesus? It all depends on whether we, where we find our identity and where we find our power to walk that out. Well, let's close this with prayer. About the same time that the rain stops. Okay.